Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of The Flower Lounge. I am thrilled to have this week's guest, Pixie Lighthorse. You know, with a name like that, it's going to be good. Pixie Lighthorse is the author of the Prayers of Honoring series. Pixie received her training in Western shamanism between 2003 and 2012. She was born in California, and she grew up among farms, ranches, animals, and wildlife. She studied literature and art at Cal State, Northridge, and several other higher learning institutions, and she's an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Feminine and earth-centered sensibilities form the cornerstones of her work, and she lives with her family in Central Oregon. And let me tell you her website now, and I'll repeat it at the end, but her website is pixielighthorse.com. Thank you, Pixie, for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. Okay. So we usually start out with an exercise where we ask you to close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers or plants or trees. And just think about what you were doing at the time and who you were with. See if you can identify a favorite flower or botanical. And then just reflect on what the three words would be if you could describe its personality. And then whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and just share a little bit about what you're thinking. So when I was about eight years old, my dad planted a young magnolia tree in our front yard in this teeny little farm town that you can read about in Steinbeck's books and um, <laughs> various labor camp and farm town, southern, south central California type environment, very warm and very lending of itself to desert slash tropical flowers. And so this magnolia was sort of really out of place there. And I, <laughs> of course, I didn't know that at the time. All I knew is that it rained down these little pineapple-like stems. We just called them pineapples when I was a child. But I often would put my hand on the trunk and walk around and around and around the flower bed in circles. And I just felt grounded. I felt sort of that, that sensation that you get with trees, which are um, you know, really rooted into the earth and branches really extended into the sky. So just both and, you know, straddling those two, those two worlds. And the, and the scent of the magnolia was so heavenly. I remember thinking, there's not anything that smells better than this. <laughs> until I met Gardenia <laughs> and then I cheated. <laughs> That's okay. They understand. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I don't take it too personally. So what we find is that the way you describe your childhood favorite would describe the way that you bring your greatest gifts into this world. And so the words that I heard you say were grounded, extended, rooted, straddling two worlds and heavenly. Does that sound like you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. It's so beautiful. Well, I should preface this episode with the, to the listeners that I am at this point really fascinated by grief. And I think that it's just something that I never experienced until I was 40. And I think to myself, how did I live for 40 years and experience very extreme, intense emotions, but never, ever tackle grief? And I just find it very, very interesting. So Pixie is a wealth of information and she does a lot, but I'm particularly interested in the topic of grief because of your new book that just came out. Yeah, gosh, where to begin? Um, Prayers of Honoring Grief is so much a, it's the kind of conversation that a beginner can be comfortable with, as well as someone who is seasoned with dancing with what what it feels like in the body and how to identify it. I was just going to say there's something really interesting I found on your website that you're saying that our culture has a tendency to numb out or to just like, let's get on with it and not yeah. really address what's going on. And I just wanted to quote something that you wrote that I thought was really beautiful. 
grief is a natural and normal way of dispersing energy throughout the body's wise and impeccable systems. And I wondered if you could talk about that. Well, tell me first, do you agree with that? I do. <laughs> Good. Then we then we're on the same <laughs> ground here. Yeah. So I think that we are cultured to because of course we live in a very, you know, the the old buzzword, the patriarchy. We live in a very masculine dominant world here in the West. And what that means is that we're going and doing more than we are being and resting. And so grief happens in a being and resting state. And it doesn't have much of a home in going and doing. And so if we insist on going and doing all of the time, then grief will really sneak up on you. And then, you know, it's sort of, I think of all things as having their own kind of personality or character. And I remember you having, I don't know if we talked about it in email, but just the botanicals have their own language and their own voices and their own kind of persona. And so I think about emotions and some of the elemental teachings to be this way too, that they, that grief is sort of like a She's sort of like that old woman at the crossroads who, if you don't go there willingly, then she will come for you. And when she comes for you, you know, it's, the lessons are not kind and gentle. <laughs> <laughs> they have, they're the take you to your knees sort of experiences. And um, this is wonderful for someone who is waiting for their spiritual awakening. Grief is a portal into that place of remembering who they are and and how important what the you know what the true matters that should be deserving of attention are either way it shakes out i think it's it's a good thing but to start wading into those waters willingly i think guarantees that it will not be a being held down under <laughs> kind of experience when the time comes and when you were talking earlier about knowing what it feels like in your body and how to identify it and just the curiosity around what are the most common sources of grief that you see and how do people know that what they're experiencing is grief? Well, the emotions and, and actions and choices that are, that want that one gives to themselves at the loss of a loved one or a very serious health diagnosis seem to be the, some of the only acceptable forms of grief that will allow, you know, because we have a very non loitering policy in our culture that says, don't hang out in dark places for too long. You know, don't go, don't go down dark roads and spend time with, with wolves and such, because, you know, you'll really get off path and then you'll completely miss your, your mark. And so all of our cautionary tales are sort of the result of our fairy tales and our mythological lore being reduced to the sort of the Aesop's fable version of, you know, mm -hmm. don't go, you know, don't go into the dark woods alone or, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of sentiments mean that that we don't, we won't allow ourselves to really spend any time, you know, and let's say, in my opinion, I think 49 or so percent of our living days could very well be spent in solitude, reflection, a feeling state, a resting state, tending state. And, you know, I don't know if I had to guess, I would say that we're, we're a bit obsessed. So maybe we sort of give that 80-20 so that we expect ourselves to like be in the light the majority of the time. So we get very, we have very little patience when folks come around and they say, I'm still just really feeling this terrible feeling. The only time that that's allowed is if it's the death of someone, a loved one. If it's the loss of a dream or the loss of a child or the loss of childhood or the loss of your voice, we just don't seem to have a lot of patience and tolerance and empathy for that. And so how it lives, how grief lives in the body, I think is, um, it settles, you know? So if I had to maybe paint a picture of it for myself and my people, I would say that 
grief just becomes heavy at the bottom and it starts to feel sluggish inside of us and it starts to slow us down. It might have things going around in our minds that we don't really tend, but we are able to be distracted by. And, and it's very unconscious at that point. And so it doesn't, we might start to emote when we watch a movie or we hear a certain song. And so I think of that as priming the pump for going really in, deep into what is really there. But oftentimes we just leave it at that surface level. And so, um, you know, if you find that you're weeping about at a movie, you might seek or a scene in a film, you might take it a little deeper by exploring what of that, that scene is touching a place in yourself that is hurting or empathetic or feeling or might be asking for some tending. So, you know, our eyes are sort of like the, the windows, you know, they emote, they tear up, they well up. And we even have, you know, we still have a lot of 20th century messages about not letting our emotions move through our body. And grief is just sort of one of those. So there's something else on your website that I noticed about celebrate pain or celebrate an access to your feelings and this idea that a traumatic experience, and I say trauma, you know, it could just be like your heart got broken or your child went away to college and you have empty nest, right? Some certain kind of trauma as a catalyst to awakening our spiritual essence or a desire to do some sort of spiritual practice or something that just absolutely brings us to our knees and there's just nowhere to go. There's nowhere to like, like there's, it's almost like you have no choice to do anything, but just face this intensity of emotion. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you wanted to talk about the fact of, you know, how trauma can push us into this sort of like longing or yearning for spiritual connection. Yeah, I think that, you know, it is, we have a very interesting kind of dialogue inside of ourselves with our trauma, um, which I don't know. I mean, I'd be really hard pressed to agree that I think that everyone has trauma living in their body, whether it's as a result of a transition that you were speaking of, you know, empty nest or a rite of passage that, that you really felt on a deep level, even, even a young woman getting her moon is a, is a transition. And suddenly there's all this body responsibility. And so, you know, how we're defining trauma is, is becoming more accommodating for all of the, the, you know, that spectrum. So I think that whatever it is that brings us to our knees or causes us a great discomfort, that there's a lot of medicine in that. Um, and so that's our task is to turn toward that wounding, that, that stockpile of feelings, that discomfort, that sabotaging or sacrificing of our voices or the, these things that are our birthrights and to turn towards those woundings and hurts and unreconciled contents and start seeking the medicinal quality of those experiences. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting how, yes, absolutely. Like on the other side of a really intense experience, you know that it's medicine, you know, like you can see the, the things that have evolved from that, you know, the depth of compassion, or if you funneled it into some creative endeavor, like, I wrote an entire book of poetry. Like I never wrote poetry ever in my life until I faced grief and needed somewhere, needed to channel it into something. And yet when you talk about voices, I find it really interesting because, you know, we can have those voices that are like, well, you're not supposed to want this or you're not supposed to feel this or aren't you done with this yet? Or isn't this over yet? Didn't you just go, didn't you, haven't you been over this for like six months now or a year? Like this is coming up again, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the bully and the inner tyrant. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's really, it's really comical that we, we have those so many different parts within us that, you know, I'm, I suppose if I look at it in a loving way, they're just protectors. They're protecting us from going into the 
forest with the wolves, like you say, to the intensity of emotion. So do you have any advice for the listeners who say are experiencing grief and yet, you know, have these inner voices or tyrants or I call it bossy girl, my inner bossy yeah. girl. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, so, and many folks, particularly in Eastern philosophies and things would call it ego. And, you know, the ego is what protects us when we go out into the world. I hear these, these folks saying things like you have to, you know, slay your ego or kill. And I'm like, no, 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 don't slay your ego. This is a really essential part of who you are. You just have to be able to, you know, dominate the unhelpful. You have to parent the ego a little bit sometimes, especially when it's coming from a childhood wound and it's trying to direct from overprotection. Protection is great. Overprotection. This is like helicopter parenting. You know, we, we don't necessarily need to fret as much. Um, and so our, you know, certain aspects of our psyche seem to seek to protect from all suffering and, you know, God bless it. I mean, can you really fault it for wanting to be avoidant of everything that might harm or hurt? But meanwhile, we cannot amputate these aspects of the psyche. They're so incredibly critical for our wholeness. So these voices of the bully, you know, when you can confront and say, you know, it's maybe sounds a little bit juvenile, but, you know, thank you so much for your concern and care. And this is what we're doing. I'm driving. <laughs> you go ahead and buckle in safely back there. And I'm sure if there's some real danger, you're going to be the first one to let me know about it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think it's important to realize that those parts of us aren't who we really are. They're like aspects or threads or voices, as you call them. But there is a vast part of ourselves, the observer, that is that is really us, right? Yeah. And I think what happens is we just get so caught in by the particular parts and pieces or voices and think that that's us. Well, it's all us. If you think about it in terms of being sort of like a panel discussion, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the, <laughs> the children's movie Inside Out was really helped me explain to my kids how, how there are a lot of emotions vying for attention inside of us. And so in the movie, you know, joy tries to usurp every other emotion and, and they come to realize in the end that actually they're all of equal value and they all do get to weigh in and the whole of them is what makes us, you know? So our super consciousness or, you know, our higher, our more elevated consciousness, basically our maturity in, uh, enables us to say, well, let me just think about that for a second and then I'll make a decision. You know, I'm not going to knee jerk react from a place of fear or sorrow or anger. I'm going to just pause for that few seconds and assess, is this true? Is this necessary? Is this helpful? Um, and so that panel discussion is, is, you know, in, in a tough situation, you really do have to consider what all of, all of them <laughs> air quotes, have to say, um, because sometimes that's your poetry that you're channeling um, and any art, the, you know, the voice I'm really speaking of is our creative voice, the voice that seeks to express it all. And it's the culmination of that kind of panel discussion. And so when it comes through in poetry or in prayers or in novels or in music, um, it's really important to have all those voices weighing in. You would, you would, it would be like having an orchestra with no violins. That's a really good metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting in, in terms of the creative projects, like as you're saying in my poetry, I can actually see those parts and pieces come through and their voice, you know, oh, that's that part. Oh, that's that part. Oh, that's that part. And then also seeing when, when you can really get into just really raw vulnerability mm -hmm. and I feel like it's such a gift. It's such a tremendous gift. It's not easy. Of course, it's painful. But grief is, I feel like, one of the most transformative emotions that there is or situations or states that there is. Would you agree? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree. I think that it leads somewhere, whereas some emotions settle and or end, you know, like an angry explosion, for example, doesn't usually lead to anywhere. If it leads to a cathartic place, then, and I don't want to demean anger in any way, but I would just say that, yes, I agree with you. Grief is a transformative place. It just evolves in a beautiful way 
over time. And that's really where you can do some serious gold mining. How do you recommend to people to do the gold mining? Well, I have another book coming out in November called Gold Mining the Shadows, which is sort of the follow-up to boundaries and protection. Grief is sort of woven in there as a critical piece that can't be left out of the puzzle. And beginning with grief might be as simple as, you know, taking an inventory of the things that still hurt, um, that still bother you, or that you still experience and feel a pain about losing. Um, I mean, just, it could be pages and pages and pages for all of us. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're hooked into that Mm -hmm. or that we're willing to spend a tremendous amount of time on those particular losses, but just the acknowledgement of them can be very transformative because it's just admitting more of the truth. And so when the truth lives inside of our body, we can feel that kind of vital sensation. And when it's being covered up by shoulds and self-consciousness and other things, then it just It's just sort of like the quiet person in the class who has really, really valuable things to teach and say, if we could just, if they could ever just get a word in edgewise. (laughs) I'm sure many of your listeners can relate to being the one who didn't get to speak his or her truth in, in a public setting. So to me, that's what grief is like. It will, it will grow angrier or it will grow bigger or it will in some way sort of become an instrument of war inside of ourselves um, if we aren't willing to tend it. And it does. We see it all over. And this is, we wouldn't be having any conversations about nuclear war in our uh, world today at all if their if grief was tended. There would be no reason to. Right. I think we, we suppress certain truths because they're either not pretty or they're, like you said, there's a should involved. I shouldn't feel that or I shouldn't feel when, I mean, at least what I've noticed from my meditation practice is like when you acknowledge something, it already shifts character. It already shifts form. It's like when you're sitting in meditation and you see that your mind is thinking, it already starts to quiet down just from noticing the thoughts, right? And so when you just, like you said, the acknowledgement of this is actually how I'm feeling, I think what happens is we're afraid that it's going to take over us. We're afraid that that little voice or that wolf or that, you know, whatever it is, is going to just engulf us if we admit it. But actually it's the opposite. Once you just name it, it diffuses all the energy, right? It does. It feels like it will devour or swallow us up whole it, I hear folks in my classes and things say that I'm just afraid that when the, after the floodgates open that I won't be able to close it. You know, it's a loss of control. And sometimes a loss of control, if it's harming no one, is exactly what is called for. And grief, the loss of a loved one is one of the few things that will get that wail and that moan and that weep out of a modern human. Right. And when you think about your metaphor of the floodgates, it's like once you let the water out, the water's gone and you're mm-hmm. fine. It's just, it's more like the pressure that mm-hmm. you're sensing that feels like it's going to take over. I remember hearing my teacher say like, go ahead, lose your mind. Go ahead and lose your mind. Yeah. What That's are you afraid is going to happen? That's a good thing. Lose your mind. <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes we're afraid of you know, just those really intense emotions. And another thing that comes to mind, I'm not sure this is just popping in from something that my teacher shared with me long ago. And he was like, well, when you can look in the mirror at yourself and just say like, I am such a loser (laughs) and face that, then you've, then you've gotten somewhere because it's almost, it's almost like you, you acknowledge those parts of yourself that you don't like, or that you've been resisting or that you felt are a weakness. And when you acknowledge it, it's like, it just dissolves into nothing. And then you finally find your strength. It's like when you feel so crappy that you're like nothing but a speck of dirt or dust, then you become the world. Yeah. It's rock ass bottom. Rock ass bottom. (laughs) (laughs) You get rock ass bottom and then you become the earth. That's right. 
Well, then all things are possible, you know, because it's our fear of that, which is causing so much tension, um, which leads to so much pain. It's sort of that vicious cycle, you know, FTP, fear leads to tension, leads to pain. And you can manifest it right in your body if you're going to want to, you know, live in that state. And it's, it seems like it's just, it's like all resistance. So how do we, how do we like loosen up and soften resistance to ourselves? I tell you, having children really helps. Um, my son just <laughs> said to me a couple of days ago, uh, you know, you're trying too hard. You're always trying so hard to be a good mom. So you need to relax. And dad just <laughs> needs to take a chill pill. He said. <laughs> They're looking at us and going, what is wrong with you people? What are you so worked <laughs> up about? You know, and, and they do, they see a lot of things um, that are happening how do we, you know, I think that we have to, if I didn't have a sense of humor, I think I'd be in really dire straits because there's definitely a part of me that is the dominant part of me is very serious, pretty stoic, pretty, you know, exploring all the avenues, you know, really on a mission to find some more information and answers. And that can just be a really furrowed brow kind of experience. (laughs) Um, So without a sense of humor and some serious, goofy, the ability to turn off my brain, and I see that this is really so important in my my people around me and my immediate family. Also, turning, you know, turning all that down a notch really helps. Just getting silly. Yeah, absolutely goofy, silly. Yeah, silly pictures. I sent my my daughter a picture yesterday of lips made out of strawberries, and she thought it was the best thing in the world because you know. of the time I'm, you know, poking her in the back to get her homework done or to, you know, do all of these things. And so silly just breaks up the rigid crust. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think so often we're trying to figure things out, right? Mentally, intellectually figure things out. And that's one of the reasons why I, it sounds weird. I love grief that sounds strange, but I love grief because it just takes us into such a a state of intensity that you can try to figure it out. I mean, you can bang your head against the wall for months and months and months, but ultimately you get to this point of just like, oh, surrender. I'm just going to feel it because there's nothing I can do. So I'm just going to let this tidal wave wash over me and just let it be, right? I like infinite love, your blend, when I, particularly the elixir the tasty one for that reason are you still making that yeah I I hope so top it's like the most popular one it's such an equalizer for when I am feeling you know that way like in total resistance sort of like once you insert that everything softens and I love the flowers that way you know there are some rough trees some very hardy shrubs we I live in the high desert. And so our flora is so different from some of the flowers that you work with, but I do love the flower kingdom for being able to soften everything, soften the dialogue, take the pressure off. They're just like the, the contingency of sweeter fairies, (laughs) you know? (laughs) <laughs> sort of like in that Tolkien sense that there are some that are very sort of, you know, hard edged. The flower people, if we could say, are just very sweet and nurturing. And yeah, I love Infinite Love is, is my favorite too. <laughs> yeah, we just we just came out with this new one. You would probably really love it. It's called Fierce Compassion. And it's mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like the Infinite Love 2.0. It's like it's like grittier. So even like the scent, it's like roses and dirt, yeah, like mud and greenery and, and liquor and caramel. And it's very compelling. And it's sort of like, I don't know, I just think of the flowers and infinite love as sort of like the love things, you know, you have, you know, like when, okay, I need to soften, I'm going to take this. But fierce compassion is like those things that we haven't dealt with since we were one or two that we just don't even have a clue that they're running in the background, like, you know, abandonment or attachment or loss. It's a really actually good one for grief because um, 
some of the flowers in there will soften states of like despair or hopelessness or, you know, just kind of reaching your, the edge of your, of your sanity in terms of emotional wounding and disappointment and that type of thing. We'll That's have to send you some. Yes, please do. <laughs> and yes, I was just posting on Instagram today about my son and having some, you know, sorting through some existential depression. And a couple of years ago, we became aware that this was really circulating in him. And so it's been an interesting journey. I think what is most fascinating of all is how much folks aren't talking about childhood depression. And so it's been just kind of a whole game changer for he and I to say, yeah, for sure, we're willing to talk about this. But earlier in the conversation, you mentioned something about um, vulner raw vulnerability. And I tucked away for later in this convo that empathy is such a, you know, vulnerability is a real gateway into an intimacy. But I think if you are not cultivating empathy for yourself and for others, that there's some significant suffering you know, kind of if your if your map doesn't have a pin on empathy. Tell me more. Okay, so the the compassion function, if you will, inside of us, the one that sees someone in suffering and feels a great deal of heartache about it, is is part of what we are collectively healing. And also, it's still incredibly wounding, wounded. So in the world that we're living in today, we are looking at equality. We are looking at opportunity. We're looking at capitalism. We're looking externally at all of these kinds of things that are really hot and on the table right now as they're long overdue to be. And then inside of ourselves, we're realizing that we can't actually change what's out there until we address what's in here. And sometimes we don't even know what's in here. So one of the one of the things that I think is important to bring attention to is, is that vulnerability, when we think of vulnerability, we think of my vulnerability. If you and I were having a conversation and I began to cry, the focus would be on me because I'm showing myself in a vulnerable way. And yet what also could be transpiring between the two of us is a level of empathy that allows for all of the healing to take place around us, that it's not necessarily your job in our conflict or our, um, our discussion for you to come and then caretake me. Cultivating empathy is about you know, mutual vulnerability and mutual empathy. And so that to, empathy to me is sort of like this, it's like a kombucha scoby. I mean, it just starts to get out of control when you really know what you're doing with it. You know, right? Well, which is what we're wanting. And then when you talk about vulnerability, I think that if you were to just break down and cry right now, that opens my vulnerability too. Because if I'm truly feeling what you're feeling, not a sense of top down looking down pity, oh, sorry for her, it's like I'm feeling what you're feeling, that makes me incredibly vulnerable too. Yeah. And I think that on your own behalf, you know, with boundaries, right. of course. Right. Right. right vulnerable in the sense of moving into a soft and tender place. Yeah, open. Feelings in general create such an incredible discomfort and anxiety for a lot of people who were repressed um, in their feelings in infancy and toddlerhood and early childhood development. It's, it's a physiological Ten tension. Yeah. <laughs> I feel it sometimes with my own children and I've had to really push through that because it's, you know, it's not so much that I'm sad with them or for them. It's that their sorrow is touching a deep place inside of me that needs tending to. And gosh, now what a, what a terrain we're traversing together at that point. Right. And I love what you said about it's opening up the space around us to be a healing space. And I think that the bright side of this conversation is that there's nothing we need to do. So it's like when you were saying it occurs in the being in the resting state, the, the, the great news is, is the solution is just being the container. It's like being that container of alchemy to just hold what's arising and you don't need to even say anything or do anything. It's like oftentimes when somebody is grieving or experiencing really intense emotions, just sitting there with them being present, not saying a word is hugely transformative for both people involved. 
and you like I may be talking to you, maybe you're breaking down, breaking apart, but that may also be breaking something down inside of me at the same time. So isn't it wonderful that <laughs> with all this fear and resistance, if we can just soften into it and just be a container and let things wash through, all of us will experience so much more healing and in not only just for ourselves, you know, past, present, future and future generations of our children, but, but also who we come in contact with and who we touch that has a ripple effect, right? Yeah, I think that we're coming out of sort of the 20th century, finally, at long last, the motif of sort of the fierce individualism that shaped us, those who grew up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, or came of age during that time, to where we're starting to go, well, gosh, you know, maybe I'm not, not Katie. You know, maybe I'm not, not my son, Miles. Maybe we are our, in our collective, we're all the, actually the same person. And so the things that are coming up, it's very difficult to sometimes wrap the mind around. I find that, yes, we have, we have personal space needed and personal boundaries for, for letting all of our organs work in conjunction on our own behalf. And at the same time, we're not so much different people. As a collective, we're, you're mirroring, mirroring to me what I love or don't love about myself. And so that, that conversation can also get a little bit confusing inside of oneself. But if we, if we weren't so beholden to a story of separation, I don't know that this conversation would be as challenging. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, you could even think of it as like, you know, any difficult experience we've had in life, it's almost like, you know, if we were to take the ultimate responsibility, it would be like, I... I called that person in and I called that experience in to learn these particular things. I called that person in as a teacher and, or we called each other in to learn from each other in that way. And I mean, what a beautiful gift when you think of it with that sort of eagle eye perspective. Yes. The caveat when you're early on in your healing process, the trouble around that sometimes is that for someone who is in a really a PTSD state or in a state of deep trauma, that leverages responsibility in a way that is sometimes really counterproductive to the healing process. But I have seen over time, in myself included, how we get to a place where we're like, oh, okay. Right, right. That the other side are, of it. The arc of that has, is now showing me how that could be possible. But in this early stage, I would never want to say that to someone, I don't think, because they're just not there yet. That could actually set them back on their path a little bit. But I, I completely agree that somehow what we're shown is working you know, in mutuality with what we're already made of and therefore creating an almost kind of a fun alchemy, which can be a real pisser sometimes, you know, we, because we, live in, we, we exist primarily in blame culture, you know, where we want to pin our discomfort on others or pin the world's or the nation's troubles. We don't want to see that existing inside of ourselves. And to me, that's really problematic, you know, tending the inside garden so that the outside garden grows with more health is sometimes that's the only thing that we can do. We can't neglect those bits of ourselves. And um, move through the world as arrogantly as if that those darker qualities and capacities for, you know, unwellness don't also exist inside of us. They absolutely do. And it's not shameful. You know, it is our job to learn how to kind of be the master of our lives, though. So we do have to, in a sense, dominate that which would steer us in the wrong direction or take us down a real path of unwellness. But if it's not there, then we don't know what we're even up against. Mm -hmm. And when you say dominate, what does that mean? Or what is yeah. that practice behind that? Kind of a dirty word. I mean, dominance and dominating sounds, it, it, it grates on me a tiny little bit. And I think when I, when I go ahead and use it, it's because I need to know my own strength to get a little bit above that, which is still hurting and haunting me so that I can be in, you know, the bus driver uh, so that I can be steering us in the direction that we need to go. But I would be really um, remiss not to 
at least listen to those impulses, those urges, those, you know, like those kinds of things. Like, you know, if I was 22 right now, I would, <laughs> I would drink that entire bottle of whiskey or I would, you know, <laughs> stay out all night dancing on the top of that, you know, that building in an area that's not known for being safe or, you know, whatever your idea is of putting yourself in, you know, a lot of risk taking or promiscuity of, of actions. I think that sometimes we need to be able to listen to that part so that we can make a, make a different choice. The wild um, side. Yeah. There's so much sweetness in the wild side and we can make all kinds of choices in our maturity and our adulthood that converse with that aspect without harming or betraying or, you know, like others or, you know, doing damage to our own cellular integrity. And <laughs> that may not be the worst case, you know, the worst thing in the world. Certainly there are circumstances where taking risks, you know, leaving, leaving unhealthy situations or reclaiming, you know, women right now are in their next big wave of reclaiming their sovereignty. And so sometimes that means leaving very conventional relationships behind or, you know, no longer putting on the red pumps of the 19 whatevers in order to be of service in a way that is so incredibly depleting of our own resources and integrity. It's just kind of the next gen of that. And so, you know, it depends on how you pitch it. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, I'm all for like discovering the wild sides of ourselves so that they don't somehow sneak out, right? So they don't sneak out in other ways where we're not fully conscious. It's good to like feel and face and listen to them head on. So we, so yeah, so you can be really transparent about rather than having them leak out, you know, right, which is sort of the nature of shadows, you know, they will start to leak out and grief does too. I think that it has a tremendous impact on our daily wellness and our relationships when it's not being acknowledged and tended to. So what is, do you, so in your work, do you see that there are particular stages of grief? Well, you know, there's sort of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross approach of going through all of the stages of confusion and, and denial and anger and blame and and some of these things. But I think that, I mean, what prayers of honor and grief really is about is it can be a very helpful tool for when you are facing very obvious grief, the loss of a loved one. But I think that the conversation that I'm really wanting to have and for folks to have with themselves as they read it is what is untended that's kind of building up for me. Um, you know, what's lingering in there that just, it was wanting just to witness, just to say, you know what, I've actually been saying that in my quiet inner dialogue, I've been saying that that wasn't bothering me. And actually it's, it has had, and is still having an impact on me. And that truth telling, even if it's just with yourself can be really powerful that's what I was going to just going to ask you. You read my mind. Was, what questions can we ask ourselves? Can you think of any other questions? You said, what, what is untended and what's lingering that wants to be witnessed? Any other questions you can think of we should ask ourselves? Uh, yeah. I mean, what hurt a long time ago that never got a chance to be resolved? You know, what is sitting unreconciled within me? I think when we look at our resentments too, our unmet expectations, we'll find grief kind of tucked away into those corners too. And what have you found, how have you found the, the power of prayer at softening our resistance to feelings or um, connecting us with our spirituality? What is, what is it about prayer in your experience? Yeah, it's such an open dialogue with the source that is meaningful to the individual and returning and reclaiming power, personal power to be able to determine who or what that is, either very distinct or incredibly ambiguous, is, is to heal some of that spiritual trauma and, and religious trauma of our 
generations, our previous generations, where, where all things are turning much more fluid and becoming water. And, you know, our children are having conversations about gender that we would have never, ever been able to, to have. You know, those conversations were teeny seeds, even in the 80s and 90s. And so I think that the, the opportunity and the healing that can happen when we're in dialogue with any power greater than ourselves is that we're saying it out loud to ourselves. And maybe we're, com- you know, maybe we're sharing that with some other force, some other energy. We know that we are walking, breathing electricity, and we know that lightning flashes in the sky and that there's gravity and that the planets are orbiting in a pretty particular and predictable way. So with that knowledge alone, in terms of actual energy or you know what those in Eastern medicine would call chi or life force, is to conduct a healing dialogue that helps us come into a place of sort of an impeccable state of honesty with ourselves that I find to be sort of like a cleansing or a cleaning. You know, I think that our thought processes and our emotional processes deserve the kinds of bathing and showers that we give to our physical bodies. I mean, I actually don't personally know anyone who doesn't, who goes a week without bathing or showering. Do you? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, two he's, weeks? He's, he's kind of a special, special person. And he hasn't showered <laughs> since 2003, but this is well, not, a, I don't think he's a normal human being, so. <laughs> and he may be moving and transmuting all that is, you know, accumulating through in another way that doesn't look like traditional bathing or showering. But I would say maybe for the, for the masses, we are Longer typically- Longer than a week is a little extreme, right. <laughs> typically washing off the buildup, you know, the excess sure. oils or the grime or, you know, the, the different things that accumulate. So our internal bodies, emotions, and minds, and I think benefit from that just as well. So what are you doing to clean your, to clean your spirit? What are you doing to wash and bathe and relax your emotions? What practices do you do to, in order to do that? I spend a lot of time outside barefoot. I spend a lot of time trying to observe and understand plants, especially the plants that grow right here outside my doorstep. Yeah. And it's the conditions that bring new species out each year is it's definitely a candy store kind of experience for me because certain, you know, we've had lots of rain um, in the last few days and little things are popping up that I've never seen here before. And so, you know, we know that rain has an extra molecule of oxygen in it. And so simply watering with the water hose or city water or things doesn't create the alchemy between what's living inside the soil and, and the water. And so that union, that marriage, that sort of conscious, you know, that conception rather is so mysterious and mystical and beautiful to me. So just engaging that process is like a bath for my mind and my emotions. I can always see in the plants and the animals and sometimes the geology, the rocks, the grandmothers and the grandfathers too, how to be. They're just show, showing me always in the right moments, you know, in the, through their shapes and their scents and their textures and the directions that they're growing in. And all of that is, is just, they're teaching us every time we interact with them. Do you really look to the natural world? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being with us. If anyone would like to, your book is available on your website, right? So if you are interested in this beautiful book of prayers for grief and other books that Pixie has available, you can visit pixielighthorse.com. And just in, in wrapping up, is there anything that you find yourself often telling others like a piece of advice or a a piece of wisdom that you find is commonly bubbling up out of you right now? I would say give that percentage of darkness of, of shadow, a little bit of your face time, you know, check in with yourself, take your, take your inventories and check in with yourself around 
what you might be seeking to diffuse by means of projecting onto others and how can you through honesty and truth telling with your panel <laughs> panel discussion <laughs> how can you have some power over that by taking ownership of it in yourself it's sort of on my table right now love it thank you so much for being with us pixie Thank you. Thank you for your beautiful flower offerings and all of the ways that you bring one of my core values, beauty, into the world and um, allow us to taste them and get them on our skin and combine them in such a high integrity way. And also thank you for your generosity. Others may not know that you have this incredibly wildly generous um, side, but I know of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Pixie. <laughs> Thank you for being with us again. For more of Pixie's work, visit PixieLightHorse.com. And we are so appreciative that you are here for this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on the Flower Lounge. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Lotus Way. Thank you so much for listening to the Flower Lounge podcast. We now have listeners in 61 countries. And I just want to say that I am so grateful that you'd spend your time with us. I also want to take a second to give a shout out to Lotus Way, who makes this podcast possible. We recently released a new flower essence blend that has been a game changer for us. In fact, it's called Game Changer, and it's a combination of the most powerful flower essences for being totally present. Because if you, like me, you might have experienced on occasion having a really big to-do list, a little overwhelming, feeling constantly on the go, and the sense that time is flying by. Where did last week go? You may want to check out the Game Changer. It makes you feel like you have all the time in the world. You can take breaks without feeling guilty like you should be doing something else. You feel crystal clear with the ability to make decisions really effortlessly. And things that seem kind of heavy or a pain in the butt on your to-do list to do before now just seem like super easy. So if you have gotten any value out of listening to the podcast, we'd love your support. We're currently under contract to buy a new building where we'll be able to open a store, have an education center, offer botanical treatments and flower licks or happy hours, and have a cool new podcasting space that will be a major upgrade from where we are now. So at that time in the fall, when we move into our new space, we will have had a year of podcasting under our belt and we'll be starting up a whole new format that you're going to love that will be even more engaging and interactive. So again, thank you so much for your support, for listening and for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.